When you ask an evolutionist for an example of any creature changing kinds, you will invariably be asked for a definition for the word kind. As if it's that difficult to understand. A five-year-old can see a lion and a tiger and recognize that they are the same kind. It shouldn't be this difficult. These same people would be surprised to find out that there is an entire scientific discipline devoted to the identification of these created kinds called baromenology. If it's easy for a five-year-old to understand, what does that say about these supposed scientists? I had to investigate. The meaning of the word kind is a matter of much debate, even amongst creationists. Being translated from the Hebrew word min, it seems to denote some sort of variety, but the full definition is difficult to discern. Although Genesis does state that all creatures reproduce according to their kind, it does not expressly preclude the notion of a kind diversifying into kinds within kinds. Regardless of this, the typical creationist view is that these kinds were all created separately, having no relation to each other whatsoever, and with no possibility of kinds within kinds. Many creationists, such as Ken Ham, have defined a kind as being equivalent to the taxonomical clade family. This would mean that humans are the same kind as chimps, bonobos, gorillas, gorillas, and orangutans as they are all part of the cladistic family hominidae. And of course we can't have that. In 1941, Seventh-day Adventist and self-described fundamentalist scientist Frank Lewis Marsh published Fundamental Biology. In his book, Marsh combined the Hebrew words bara, meaning to create, and min to form the word baramen. Although the actual Hebrew doesn't quite translate this way, he defined this combination as created kind. In his later work, he loosely defined it similarly to species, as a population with the ability to interbreed, but also acknowledged that the definition wasn't complete as he was quite aware of the observed speciation of Drosophila flies in laboratory experiments. He made sure to express that there are limitations that separate various kinds and rendering common ancestry impossible, a concept he dubbed discontinuity systematics. Despite the lack of a solid definition, this led to a new pursuit to determine the actual created kinds. As covered in several episodes in this series, an undertaking like this had been done before by Carolus Linnaeus in the 18th century. In attempting to determine the created kinds, he discovered more and more relationship between groups enabling him to eventually unify all animals and especially all plants. This became the foundation for modern taxonomy. In 1990, Kurt Wise coined the term baromenology for the pursuit of these created kinds. In 1996, creationist Todd Wood and others founded the Baromenology Study Group with an expressed purpose of developing a new view of biology that is consistent with the biblical record. By 2003, the group now identified as BSG had proposed a refined definition for baromen based on four concepts. Biological character space, essentially the characteristics that an organism possesses. Potentiality region, the range of variation that is possible for an organism. Continuity, being essentially the overlap of features between separate organisms. This is to be distinguished from mere similarity of features. And discontinuity, the obvious lack of features between separate groups of organisms. By these criteria, the term holobaramin is defined as the continuity of a potentiality region without regard for the discontinuity with other organisms. This is meant to be the method for determining which species are descended from the same baramen. Like the many definitions for species that I discussed in the previous episode, this definition has a weakness in that it is impossible to determine how much potential for variation a group of organisms has, and ultimately that on many levels all organisms do share commonalities, including the same nucleotides comprising DNA as the method of inheritance. So where do we draw the line on what we consider to be identical characteristics? In 2010, the prestigious Answers Research Journal featured a critique by multiple authors of Todd Wood's methodology. Among them, David DeWitt from the Creation Research Society addressed Wood's classification of Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Australopithecus sediba as unequivocally members of the human monobaramen, even going so far as to assert that they were all post-flood descendants of Adam that led the dispersal from the Tower of Babel. 
As discussed in episode 83, this directly contradicts the professional opinions of the vast majority of creationists. But Wood is, of course, only following the evidence wherever it might lead. Fellow creationist Dr. Gordon Wilson also criticized baromenology as contradictory to the Bible, his main criticism being that strong conclusions cannot and should not be made regarding hollow baromens. Another criticism being that the tenets of baromenology were used by Phil Center to establish in two separate papers the continuity between birds and dinosaurs, including theropods and, more specifically, celurosaurs, thereby uniting them all under the same hollow baromen. Wood responded to this in 2011 by examining the variations in these species and noting the distinct similarities between them, but concluding that the differences far outweighed them, essentially rejecting the vast majority of his data set. It is this lack of any rigorous methodology that leads scientists to find baromenology to have no application. It is an attempt at a standard for determining kinds that employs ad hoc justifications for not accepting its own conclusions. In a sense, it is a retracing of the steps taken by Carolus Linnaeus, but with the conclusion in mind at the outset. But then again, it took ten editions of Systema Naturae for Linnaeus to completely solidify his cladistic tree, and it has taken the efforts of generations of succeeding scientists to refine it. And yes, a five-year-old can see similarity in different types of cats and different types of horses. A five-year-old can also see similarity between both of those groups. But why are we using that as our benchmark? A five-year-old can easily look at the sky and conclude that the sun is circling the earth. A five-year-old can also see that the earth appears to be flat. More Importantly, a five-year-old can provide empirical evidence for the existence of Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and the Tooth Fairy. Perhaps our conclusions should be based on our observations and experiments instead of our intuitive notions that are so often shown to be wrong. This also sidesteps the question, which was not for an example, but for a definition. If it's so easy to understand, it should be easy to define. In the end, the concept of a kind could easily be defined as a clade or taxon and have no conflict with modern science at all, allowing for kinds within kinds. At least that type of definition has some application. The methods of baromenology are a truncated hybrid of the genetic and typological methods of determining species, which individually have far more application. This is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.